joining us today at Under Grace Ministries. It's a privilege to share what's on my heart with you each week. Our prayer is that Under Grace Ministries is that through these devotions, a foundation by the Word of God be laid, so that you are strengthened by the Holy Spirit, bringing to you enlightenment, that you will be edified and encouraged, and to know the Father's love for you in Christ Jesus. Drawing closer to the Lord Jesus with a deeper knowledge of His love and grace, knowing he will provide for you, for he is a good father and our good shepherd. He will meet all your needs spiritually, emotionally, physically, breaking down all the bondages that would keep you from his fullness for you because he loves you. His word is truth, and in, in his truth you are set free. May this ministry draw you to seek to enter into his rest with full assurance of his faithfulness. Let us open our hearts to the Lord and hear what is spoken today and consider with the Holy Spirit what he's saying to you personally. Let's pray. Father, your word is a transforming light that reveals to us your glory, your truth, and the hopes that we have in you through your son, Jesus. Lord, we set our hearts to follow you and long to be close to you always. We cling to your robe with childlike faith. Thank you, Lord, that you keep us in the shadow of your wings. Cause us, Lord, to know you and to grow in the grace and the knowledge of you. And thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness in keeping us and prospering us as our souls prosper. Lord, we choose to look to you and not fear, especially in these times that we're living in. But we know, Lord, because we know you are on the throne. Today, Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts to hear what your spirit is saying. We ask you, Lord, to write it on our hearts and renew our minds and transform us into your image. And may the words of truth fall on the good soils of our heart. Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and anoint this time together and make my words yours. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Today I'd like to look at the book of Ruth. Recently, the book of Ruth has been brought before me, actually, repeatedly. The Lord is revealing in the book of Ruth not only his redeeming love and his grace and mercy, but I believe it can be a word for us, especially in these times that we are in. We can glean wisdom and great hope with the book of Ruth. Ruth is a story of repentance, obedience, and redemption. It's a decision that determines destiny, a unique love story, the Book of Ruth. The Book of Ruth is found right after the Book of Judges. It was a time of spiritual confusion and moral decay, as far as the nations were concerned. But really, if we look at from God's throne room, with the, his perspective in the midst of it all, we can see that God is working out his plan in those hearts and lives that were open to him. And it's still true today. Though you and I look at the overall situation of our time that we live in, our nation or our people, and we say, everything's really starting to fall apart. Yet God is always working out his plan in the hearts and in the lives of those who are open unto him. 
the book of Ruth gives us the insight into the work of God. Let's look at Ruth for a moment. When looking at the person of Ruth with spiritual eyes for a moment, we can see a picture of the old man and the new man, or in this case, woman. Ruth marries a man named Boaz, who is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, a kinsman redeemer. Ruth found favor in the eyes of Boaz, and the book of Ruth reveals the favor, the grace, and redemption that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at chapter, uh, the first chapter. The first chapter of the book of Ruth is about choices. We're all facing things in our life that cause us to make decisions. Important decisions that you and I make can be life-changing. Let's look at how one choice changed this family's destiny. In Ruth 1, verses 1 through 2, the Bible tells us, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, and that there was a famine in the land, and a certain name, excuse me, a certain man named name, man of uh, Bethlehem, Judah, was Elmel. And he went and he sojourned into a country of Moab. And they came to the country of Moab, and they continued there. Now Amalek was in the land Bethlehem, Judah, and there was a famine in the land. This was really speaking to my heart, and I had learned a while back that the name of Bethlehem in Hebrew is called the place of bread, or the house of bread. And in Strong's Hebrew 1035, it tells us this, the meaning in the Hebrew. The very place of which our Savior would have been, would be born. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. John 6, 35. Let's keep this on the shelf for a little bit, okay? Emelak went to sojourn, which means he journeyed into the country of Moab, and they came into the country and continued there, meaning they stayed there. Now Moab was the arch enemy of Israel, a pagan place, and the Moabites were an offensive people and had more immoral principles. They were a pagan race. But this Israelite man, Emelech, made a decision to leave Israel because of a famine. He and his wife and the two sons went over to Moab, and that was a cursed country. As I was reading this, and as we read this as children of God, we have to make choices every day. And when it, when a trial comes, not if, we are able, are we able to handle them? Um, we have to ask ourselves, do we place our trust in governments? Do we place our trust in our workplaces? Do we place our trust in people? This was, was rising up in me when I was reading this and, um, felt like this was a time to reflect the times that we're living in and i believe there is a judgment coming to this country and we need to make faith choices and place our trust in god and his faithfulness we have choices in these times ahead and before it comes it is to be a white we're to be wise servants wise servants of the lord uh, who take god's word seriously and, and feed on it and allow it to build a foundation in us. Knowing that Christ supplies all our needs to help us survive through the storms, even the ones ahead. We're not to fear these times, but to rejoice that God is in control. And as David said in Psalms 37, 25 and 26, he said, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread interesting word, right? All day long, he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. What a promise to stand on. Now, Naomi's husband, Amalek, seems to not have been grounded in his faith. He made a decision, and it was a bad one. It was a decision that marked his life with devastating repercussions. Amalek made this bad choice with the wrong motives. He was motivated by the physical, a famine, and not the spiritual. Emelech said by his, uh, his actions, I know that God has promised to bless me, 
but I have to take care of myself. And he put the physical above the spiritual. He made this decision by walking by sight and not by faith. He saw a famine. Fear overtook him. He left the house of bread to go over to Moab. He tried to run from his trial, but he actually created an even bigger one. These were hard times, no doubt. And it's hard for us to even imagine in a, this type of uh, famine, especially when we can just stick a meal in a microwave and sit and watch a movie or read a book or whatever. We really have no clue what hard times are like. We are a get, get it now generation, but when this storm hits, it's going to cause us to really get to our knees and trust God and his provision and his protection for us. God doesn't want us to fear. He wants us to trust and rely on him fully. He wants to give you the wings of an eagle to soar over your problems, right where you are or in the storms that may come. One reason that we can see where Amalek made a wrong decision was he decided to think the grass was greener on the other side and offer himself to the wrong master. When he went to Moab, he went into the enemy's territory. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, it says, God had placed a curse upon the Moabites, and this man got his family over into the devil's territory. His two sons married the daughters of Moab, and his entire life was messed up because he could not believe God. Life is truth or consequences. Wrong choices bring consequences. And Amalek's wrong choice brought death. We will reap what we sow. And if we sow in unbelief, we reap death. We sow in righteousness and truth, we reap peace that surpasses all understanding and hope. Sowing and reaping is a principle that the Lord has placed for us to live holy lives, to walk with faith choices. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows in his own flesh, he will from his flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, I'm not saying every bad decision is going to bring you death. God is a merciful, loving, caring Father. And if we make a wrong decision with a right motive in our heart and want God's will, he will get us back on the right path. He'll bring us into his wisdom and knowledge. He will chastise us when we need it, too, for not waiting for him or for not getting clear direction. Why? Because he loves his children and he has the best for us. There's no condemnation, but we are to be wise to seek the Lord in his wisdom. We are called to seek the Lord and trust and believe he will direct us. His word is a lamp to our feet. It's a perfect light to give us direction for our steps. Psalms 119, 105. Now is the time to seek him with all our hearts to make sure nothing is stopping the flow of his spirit. God will show you and me the way in which we are to go. Psalms 32 verse 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way in which you are to go. I will counsel, counsel you with my eye upon you. God will send words in ways to get our attention. It may be from hearing from someone that you trust who is grounded in the word to share a word to you. Or the Lord will speak through the mouth of a babe. Had that happen a few times. And it's good. He will give you a word while you are driving, like hearing something on the radio, or you'll see a sign that says something into the situation to lead you to his word for more direction. He knows how to get your attention. Or as you open his word and scriptures rise up to you, or commentaries or devotional books, and you find a word of God giving you the perfect light to guide you. Sometimes waiting is what is needed before anything happens. He's always moving around things on our behalf to align them for his perfect will. And waiting is one of the hardest things. We want his wisdom and all that the Lord has for us. We want to walk hand in hand with him.
and not in our own ways. Here though, Amalek, he was seeking his own. He wasn't seeking the kingdom first. And the result is in verse four and five. Amalek died in Moab and so did his sons. The sons had married Moabite girls. His wife, Naomi, and the two daughter-in-laws were left widows in Moab. Okay, now let's look at the power of a wise choice. <laughs> Naomi hears of the blessing back in Bethlehem, and she decides to go back. That's in Ruth verse, chapter 1, verse 6. It says, Then she arose with her daughter-in-laws that she might return to the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people, by giving them bread. Therefore, she went out from the place where she was and her two daughter-in-laws with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, go return each to your mother's house. The Lord dealt kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead with me. And the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Her daughter-in-law's Ruth and Oprah decided to go with her. Well, in verses 11 through 14, Naomi, for the second time, encourages them to go back to their families. She tells them to turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I should have a hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you even wait for them to grow? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Verse 14 says, Then they lifted up their voices and they wept, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Naomi said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people, to her gods, returning after her, return after your son, your, your sister-in-law, excuse me. Verse 16 says, but Ruth said, and notice this, what these next verses is. Here's the wise decision. Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. A decision of destiny. Ruth had lived a cursed life, a crushed life. She had known only poverty and sorrow. She had lost her husband, her father-in-law. Ruth had a condemned life. Because her husband had died, she had a sentence of death upon her also. Did she know what was to come? Did she see many blessings in her time with this family to cause her to want to follow Naomi? What caused her to make this life-changing decision? Maybe it was acceptance. Maybe it was love and kindness. Naomi always had love for these girls. Naomi may have talked about the stories of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ruth loved her mother-in-law and was willing to be there for her and to follow her God no matter what. When Ruth said these words to her mother-in-law, her life was changed. She had so much against her. And had she remained, her life would have remained cursed, staying in the pagan world. Resulting of this was repentance, a heart that was turned. For it is the loving kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Romans 2, 4. She wanted not to be in this world any longer. Ruth may have seen God in Naomi and by her words and her deeds and wanted the God of Israel to be her God. When Ruth decided to stay with Naomi and serve the living God, all things became new. Just like as in Christ for us, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away, and behold, new things have come. 
Ruth had a new determination, a new direction, a new dependency, a new desire, a new devotion, a new dedication, and a new destiny. This wise life-changing choice caused her to turn, repent, a change of mind, a change of heart, a changed destiny, and the course of her uh, Gino, it was a course of her generational line as well changed. She had a regenerated, converted heart with a divine purpose now. God pursues us with his love, with circumstances, to draw us near to himself. Let's look at verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 22. Naomi returned and Ruth and the Moabite, the daughter-in-law, was with her, who returned to, from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. And when Naomi returned, she was welcomed home along with Ruth. Naomi's name in Hebrew means pleasantness. Now when they arrived in Bethlehem, the people said, Oh, Naomi has returned. And she said, Don't call me Naomi. Now remember, it means pleasantness. And then she said, call me bitter, for the Lord dealt bitter with me. Well, when life goes bad and no one knows how you're feeling, nor can they fully know, but only the Father knows, we need to seek the Lord to help us to guard our hearts against bitterness. It can take root and cause damage within us, even to the point to blame God which is a tactic of the enemy, to blame God. Satan's very nature is bitterness. He is only out to kill, steal, and destroy. He's a liar and the father of it, and no truth is in him. Our Savior Jesus has told us so in John 8, 44. Our only help is from the Lord, and when we allow the Holy Spirit in these situations of our life, he will help us focus our thoughts and rise in us to speak truth and the promises into them and those issues of life by faith. It is the power of his word that renews our minds and our souls. Tell the Lord how you're feeling. He will help you out of any destructive path. Don't be afraid to tell the Lord how you are feeling either. He already knows it and he wants to help you. He will give you his perspective to help you overcome. If nothing has opened up for you to see it at that moment, start declaring his faithfulness, his goodness, his loving kindness. He knows the longings of your heart to follow after him, and he will lift you up. Keep your heart close to his, and nothing can harm you. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 and 7 tells us to clothe ourselves with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in the proper time. Cast your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Resist the enemy, and he will flee. The Lord will give you and me the grace to persevere. Our fight is not against the flesh and blood, but it's against the evil rulers and the authorities of the unseen world, against the mighty powers in the dark world and against the evil spirits in the heavenly places. And our strength is in the Lord and in the, his might and in his power. So let's submit our lives, staying pure in heart, taking up our authority in Christ and resist the temptation to bitterness or resentment, discontentment, self-pity, fear, anything that is of our weaknesses. God will give us strength and the power to hold fast to him. And this isn't always easy, but the Holy Spirit helps guide you, comfort you, and restore you into all truth. We don't have to allow our feelings or our situations to rule us. Again, it's faith, not sight, that we walk. Amen? Back to Naomi. Naomi was dealing with re very real feelings of pain and sorrow. I mean, she lost her home. She lost her husband. She lost her sons. But she never lost her God, and he remained faithful. It seems to be our natural tendency for us to blame God for our tragedies, especially for death. 
probably because we know that God does hold the li our lives in his hands. We know that God is able to sustain life. We know that God is able to restore life. We know that the days of men are appointed by God. The Lord places these placed this scripture on, on my heart to help us you have a better understanding. And in Ecclesiastics 3, verse 1 and 2, God's word tells us there's a season for everything. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. Well, you can be sure of this. God knows all about life and death. God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. God in the flesh, Jesus became a man. He laid his life down so that we can have his life forever. Death is not the end in Christ, but the beginning, the resurrected life. So lay your sorrows down with him. Allow his life to flow through you. He knows all our sorrows. They're all written in his book and he knows and holds every tear. Psalms 56 tells us so, but we're to place our trust in him. Had Naomi known the thoughts and the plans God had for her, I wonder if her heart would have been in the moment, those moments of bitterness as much as they were. Well, she didn't have the New Testament like we do. We may not know how and when God's going to get us to the places or how he's going to even work things out. But we know he will work things together for the good to those who love him. And we do know that our victory is in Christ Jesus. We know the end of the story. Naomi thought it was all over. She thought it was the end of the road. She didn't know the plan God was working out for her. But in chapter 1, verse 21, she says, I went away full but the Lord hath brought me home again empty. When I saw this verse, I thought about how the prodigal came home to his father, receiving him with open arms. A story of forgiveness and redemption there as well. Naomi has turned back to her God, into his loving arms to help her remove the pains and the sorrows and to cleanse her of all her waywardness of her heart. Let's look at the rest of the story. Chapter two, it says, Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, and the family of Amalek, and his name was Boaz. A kinsman is a man who is one of a person's blood relation. The Hebrew term is goel, and for kinsman redeemer, it designates one who delivers or rescues. Know anyone who is like that? Well, according to the Jewish law, Boaz had the right to marry Ruth after the death of her husband. Well, God is our greatest matchmaker. Let's look at verse two. Ruth and the, Moabite, the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean the ear of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, go, my daughter. God leads us in so very natural ways and he'll position us. He always has a good plan for us. He always desires to shower and abound his blessings over us. And it doesn't have to be material or physical things. In those, it's in those sweet moments of seeing his hand on someone. It's when he reveals himself more to us we're so blessed. It's when we're seeing his faithfulness to a heart breathed prayer that has been answered. God is always at work on our behalf. I'm finding each day as I grow closer with him and as I surrender my days over to the Holy Spirit to control my thoughts, my emotions, my will, my day, I have a greater peace. And I can tell you interruptions surely come and through my day, and in a flash can change the direction and they can really throw me off course. But the Lord has a plan. And if we look to him in it, he may show us something so beautiful if we allow him to and try not to change it and have it go our own way of thinking. The book of Ruth 
shows us God is in control no matter what. Next in Ruth chapter 2 verse 3 it says, It so happened that Ruth was in the part of the field that belonged to Boaz, who just so happened to be the one of the family member of the kinsman redeemer for Amalek. Ruth went into this field each day to glean food into the fields during the harvest. There uh, was laws back then in this land uh, set by God, and in the law, God made provision for poor people. The poor of the land could come into the field after the harvesters had gone through, and whatever was there was free for the poor people. Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Verse 4. Boaz was the landlord of the field where Ruth came to find grain. He knew of her situation and told his workers to leave plenty of grain for her to find. Boaz also offered her food with the other workers and encouraged her to work in the safety of his field throughout the harvest. Boaz's characteristics were of a godly man. And thinking back a little bit, remembering that this was a time of spiritual confusion, but Boaz, he knew his God and he was walking with him. In chapter four, I'm sorry, in verse four, Boaz greets his servants by saying, the Lord be with you. And his servants said, and the Lord bless thee. He was honored and he was respected as the owner of the land. In chapter 4, Naomi encourages Ruth to go to Boaz in the evening and present herself willingly to accept a marriage proposal from him. Again, we see God's provision from the beginning when he gave the laws to Moses. Under the law, God's plans were to preserve families. If a man married a wife and died before he had any children, then it was his brother's obligation to take that woman as his wife so that the first son that was born would be named after the dead, the dead brother, so that the family's name would continue in Israel. Well, because Amalek had died and his two sons had died, this family's name was about to die also. So Ruth was actually asking Boaz to take the part of the kinsman redeemer and to have a son by her that could be named after this family of Amalek so that, that the name would not die as a family in Israel. She went down to the threshing floor and did according to all her mother-in-law had instructed her. Verse 7 says, After Boaz had eaten and drunk, he ate. his heart was cheerful, and he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. This was a tradition of offering of oneself to a man to be married. Now it happened, in verse 8, at midnight, that the man was startled. And he turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maid, maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. In verse 10, we see that he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear, for I will do for you all that you have requested, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Meaning Ruth had been known for her faithfulness to her mother-in-law and was favored. God sees all our good deeds toward others. He sees our hearts. Boaz said to Ruth, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. Ruth didn't go after the things of this world. She wanted to be a part of this family and to keep this family's heritage, a true selfless act. She knew this world, this, this, bless, this would bless Naomi. Are you beginning to see the story in the word that's leading us to Jesus? When we look at the Lord to redeem us from our past and cleanse us from our sins, it is by his favor, his grace, we too go to the feet of Jesus 
seek his healing and redeeming love. Boaz said to Ruth, I will do all that the law requires and what you have asked. Don't be afraid. I'm going to do it. Jesus has done it when he said it is finished. He has met the requirement of the law for us. Romans 10, 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. In the story of Ruth, there was one that was next of kin before Boaz. Let's look. In verse uh, chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, But it is true that I am a near kinsman. I am a close relative. However, there is a kinsman that is closer than I. He tells her, now you tarry tonight and in the morning, if he will perform to you the part of a kinsman, fine, let him perform unto thee. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then I will do the part of the kinsman to thee. As the Lord liveth, lay down until morning. Naomi also advised Ruth, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will fall. For this, man will not rest until he's gotten everything taken care of verses 14 through 18. when we're waiting on the lord holding to his faithfulness it's so hard to be still but when we know and trust that god is in control and will complete the good work he has started we can rest in him that's a good word i'm going to take that one and you can have that one too if you'd like chapter four the next day, Boaz met with his relative and presented the situation. The relative turned down the offer, and he felt it would cause harm to his own family situation. Boaz then made a commitment in front of the town leaders that he would take Ruth for his wife. <clears throat> so when Boaz rose up, he went to the gate of the city, and he sat down there, and behold, the kinsman of which he was speaking came by, and he said, Ho, oh, such a one, turn aside and sit down here. And so he turned aside and he sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. And so they sat down. And he said to the kinsman, Naomi, that is coming again into the country of Mo out of Moab, is selling a parcel of land, which was Brother Emelech's. And I thought to let you know, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and the elders of the people. And if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee. And I am after thee, he said. I will redeem it. And so Boaz said unto him, In the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. Chapter 4, verse 5. Basically, in other words, you're going to have to take Ruth, a wife, and have a son in order that the name of the inheritance might continue. So in verse 6, he says, And the kinsman redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself. At least I mess up my own inheritance. You redeem it and take the right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. And Boaz said to the elders and to all the people, Hear my witness this day that I have bought all that was Amalek's. Well, Boaz's primary interest was certainly not the field, but he bought the field in order to obtain his bride. In this, we see the heart of God, the redeeming love and the beautiful picture of Jesus Christ who bought us with his precious blood in order to be his bride, the church. Jesus purchased the field in order to take his treasure. Matthew 13, 44 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went out and sold it and all he had and bought the field. You and I are his treasure. We're diamonds in the rough, but we're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. She conceived a son. Boaz and Ruth were married and soon had a son named Ebed, Obed, I'm not going to say that right, but it's O-B-E-D, Obed, Obed. Naomi's misfortune had turned to joy and became a grandmother. Had she known that? No. 
Obed means worshiper, and he is the father of Jesse, who is the father of King David. Ruth chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. The book of Ruth, we now have exposed to us the genealogy of Christ. Jesus told us all scripture points to him. Jesus came to redeem the world back to God, to pay the price, the redemption, with his own blood and his death. Now God has put all things into subjection unto him, Jesus Christ. But we don't see all things now subjected to him yet, Hebrews 2.8. We don't see the whole thing yet. We don't have the whole picture established before us, as, but it's going to happen in this kingdom age to come. But we can see Jesus who has, was made a little lower than the angels in order that we might suffer death, crowned with, that he might suffer death, sorry, and crowned with glory and honor. We are waiting for that day in which the earth is redeemed back to God. Ruth's choice changed her destiny. Let's let the Lord work in our hearts and lay down everything that keeps us from God's ways. Let's trust our destiny into his, his arms. Let's turn our hearts to him. He knows what's best for us. And as we see this world spiraling into the darkness as it is with results of rebellion and pride, we are here right now for such a time as this, to be salt and light of the earth. May we allow the Lord to capture our hearts to the call of the destiny that he has for each and every one of us. Let's pray. Father, we cry out to you. Holy Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord God, we thank you for the book of Ruth, for the history of it, but also for the revealing of our King Jesus in and through the generation line and the heritage in which you have come forth through. Lord, we want to keep our eyes on you, not on the troubles that we are in or the things that are coming our way, but help us, Lord, by your spirit to hold fast to our confessions, to be strong to be courageous, courageous in these hard times ahead. Help us, Lord, to be bold and position us, Lord, to speak life and to lead that one that's lost to your feet. May you be glorified in these days, Lord, that you have given us remaining here as we wait for your return. We love you, Lord. We bless your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us here under Grace Ministries. We pray that you are touched by the Holy Spirit and the word of truth, growing to know who you are in Christ and all the rich blessings that flow to you for his glory. May the Holy Spirit fill your hearts with boldness, courage, strength, and power to trust and to serve the Lord. And may you be filled with him, enjoy him, grow to rest in him as the beloved in Christ. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And may the Lord bless you and keep you as you go through this week. God bless.
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb 